all let me not start that again. Here I am. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Parent to Parent. Thank you so much for joining us. And this week I wanted to talk about something that um, actually came out about a month ago. It's about childhood obesity. And, you know, it's a topic that has been front and center, especially here in America for so long, because it is a problem that has unfortunately continued to grow. And I just want <clears throat> to, excuse me, talk about the American Academy of Pediatrics. They, for the first comprehensive guide, they brought that out to treating childhood obesity in more than 15 years. And they recommend that doctors offer adolescents more intensive interventions sooner. And that includes weight loss medications and even surgery. So that really alarmed a lot of parents and a lot of folks that have kids that are maybe five, six years old, and they are um, either on the verge of being obese technically or, you know, already there. So it's something that concerns so many parents. It really is so easy to get access to bad food and it's easy to eat bad food and it's cheaper too. So it's understandable why this would kind of be a go-to thing and, and kids could slip through the cracks in this way. But I wanted to bring in an expert. So let me go ahead and bring her in. Here she is. So thank you so much. This is Dr. Mona Issa, who's a professor of adolescent medicine at UT Health Houston, also board certified by the American Board of Obesity Medicine. So Dr. Issa, I was going to first just ask you, what do you think about these guidelines that came out? Actually, it came out timely um, for the past 15 years. Uh, a few guidelines came from uh, different uh, agencies, but uh, finally the, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, uh, provide the guidelines as based on evidence, scientific evidence that um, it was the previous guidelines were lacking. And, you know, when you talk about like a six-year-old, having surgery have you met any six-year-olds that or seven-year-olds that probably could could use that uh, there is there are some criteria for a uh, bariatric surgery or uh, obesity anti-obesity surgery and uh, the minimum age is 10 years old and usually there is also an, some criteria that the patient should meet before we uh, can be approved for surgery. So no, not all the age group that can be qualified for surgery and with under certain conditions. Can you just describe just for people who may not think this is maybe locally a problem? I mean, how what kind of patients do you see coming to you? A big variety of patients. The concerning thing that for the past three years, the number of patients that came to my clinic actually significantly increased. Uh, most of the increase uh, based on the national data, it's uh, affecting the adolescents. That's in maybe for the 10 years ago, the percentage of uh, obesity was uh, about 16 percent and uh, for the last survey it was uh, almost 20 percent which is uh, the survey was done two years ago uh, and of course this is reflect on the the uh, adolescent or the younger children population and the mm -hmm. patients that we see in the clinic the concern one of the concerns that we see actually many many concerns but one of the concerns that we know that obesity comes with not by itself it comes with other comorbidities so we start to have to assess for and evaluate and manage the other comorbidities that come with obesity especially the comor the mental uh, health effect or comorbidity that comes with obesity. The number of patients who have issues, mental health, um, actually is getting really higher than before. Yes, we've done stories on that too, about how it's just these, these professionals, medical professionals, mental health care professionals are just inundated with so many patients and there's waiting lists. Uh, to get and seek that mental help. Um, what do you think is the is the some of the catalysts that that are really giving these children an unfair chance, you know, at life? For for obesity, actually, it it can affect many many uh, aspects of their life, the quality of life, 
uh, I will give you some examples like obesity can cause uh, sleep apnea, problem sleeping. The kids are tired during the day, not able to participate in uh, a activity or focus on school. Uh, exposed, getting bullied, uh, teased, and this affects their mental health and can develop anxiety and other mental problems. Uh, can lead them to uh, binge eating, which is another problem, or uh, disordered eating uh, issues. The uh, physical activity, of course, limiting the physical obesity, limit physical activity just because they don't feel like they're fit or because of the low self-esteem. So uh, another example, like uh, uh, obesity can cause one of the causes of diabetes so here we go they should start medicine for diabetes so it's really really affecting their quality of life definitely and what do you recommend parents do when they see their child sort of going in that direction i mean it's it's got to be challenging to address without um you know making the child feel some kind of way it is very very important for parents to be supportive for their children. This is really vital for them. And also make the changes that they need to be having everyone in the family has to participate mm -hmm. in the change, not to isolate them. Uh, another thing that's of course, they need to seek for medical help mm -hmm. uh, the, the, because uh, healthcare providers should screen for the all the causes of the problem and come uh, with uh, accurate evaluation mentally and physical uh, problems you need to assess for and then they come up with a plan and do the referral if they need it or start to have a program uh, or plan for them for their uh, to manage their problems and what do you think um, would the way that we're going because of the pandemic, where do you project us to be in the U.S. in terms of the number of kids who are obese? It's, things started to be a little bit better now. So I see that uh, they start to go out, they going back to school. School have uh, affecting, of course, the mental, it's given like chance for to socialize, for physical activities. So this is uh, an improvement right now. Um, in general, for at this time, actually, I feel like it's better than before few years back. Now we have many, many options. Now we understand more obesity, what it takes in order to take care of it and manage the patient for obesity, with obesity. So uh, we have access, we try to assess for all the aspects that patient need, uh, start from home, what's going on in home. Uh, we know what barrier can cause, uh, can patients struggle with, start from the income, start a family education, even their lifestyle, all this need to be assessed. And now we are more aware of this barriers that we need to identify to work on. The other thing that's uh, for, uh, we, uh, for treatment, as you mentioned, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, 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 published, just published the, the guidelines. And the guidelines actually give us many options for management. Uh, they emphasize on mm -hmm. the intensive uh, treatment plan, which is uh, actually, I think that is very important. It has to start with every single patient as we see in the clinic. Uh, they, they mention also they are uh, using medication and using uh, other options as the most, like as you mentioned, the bariatric surgery in some cases. Mm -hmm. So we have more options now than before, and we are more knowledgeable than before. So I think that just need to be for, uh, identify the patients who are at risk and start to work with them. Definitely. And I also think um, it is a cultural thing as well. Um, just, I would say personally, like I have family members who they are obese and they have children who are on that track as well. And it's just like, well, this is the food we ate and this is what we grew up on. So now, you know, not necessarily, and my family is vegetarian. And so, you know, you think, oh, vegetarian, it's all healthy, but that's not the case. Like, you know, there's all these other 
um, you know, fried foods and all of that. How do you kind of approach the older generation, maybe not from the U.S., that culturally this is just, you know, this is the food you eat. This is how things are. We don't diet. We don't, you know, do all these things. So how, how do you kind of approach that aspect of it? You listen to them first. You know, what happened? What do you usually eat? And you get more detail about yeah their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then you try to give them the education. This is what we have. What's, this is the blood test. This is possibly your child is having prediabetes. So you explain. And the, the more that you make the parents knowledge about how to manage and to let them understand, at least to to understand to have the the confidence that you're you 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 listen to them and you give them the uh the recommendation based on how they live not based yeah. on what just you give them the recommendation because this is what they have to do so yeah. they have to in, to be involved in the treatment plan mm -hmm. yeah some some people they just refuse the help it's it's a frustrating situation and which and is yeah Yes, and this is not every family or every patient is ready to make changes. Mm -hmm. So usually we take it step by step. We provide the information, we listen to them and give them a follow up appointment. So for more discussion and just to make to open the dialogue line and eventually when they be ready, actually they come back and they said, yeah, they are ready and and in the matter of fact, they make changes. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, switching gears from older, you know, um, people to younger. Um, I'm a parent. I have a three and six year old, and you know, they we eat fairly healthy, but um, you know, they're still like the goldfish and the lollipops and all that kind of stuff with their friends and everything. So, how do you kind of incorporate? I mean, it's fine, obviously, in moderation to have these things, but with kids, they have you know, all kinds of like puddings and stuff like that. How do you, how do you try to decipher what, what to give and what not to give? Okay. This I know you're not a nutritionist, but oh, I mean, if no, you have no, advice. Yeah. Uh, number one, um, the children uh, usually look up to their parents. Yes. So if their parents enjoy eating healthy stuff and express that this is something this enjoy not mm -hmm. a punishment like you have to eat your vegetable as a punishment they you yeah. enjoy so this is gonna get familiar to what you eat and they're going to follow you and try it yeah uh, parents should not give up with trying different food with their children mm -hmm. sometimes it takes 10 times to offer the food uh, food for children until they accept it right uh, uh, don't use the food as reward like if you do this i'm going to give you the chips that you like I would not use yeah the food uh, for a reward. Um, and, and why is that? Because I they're gonna be preoccupied with food and they gonna identify this is the best food. Like if I the, when you oh I see what you're when, saying okay when your words yeah with something to just mean this is the best thing. Okay, so well, this is like something <laughs> special. I'm like, if you could just be quiet for one minute. <laughs> well, you know, you, you would be, you would be happy to know this. So what I started doing is the kids get so excited because Saturday mornings we always juice. So they love juicing like the celery and we'll make like apple juice and orange juice. So they love seeing the thing go down and do all that. So it's like a family activity, but. Exactly. You know, and this is, this is actually another thing that you do to the children to, in order to make it like the meal fun just right. have them participate in preparing right. the meal yes yes i mean generations my whole family's from india so but i'm the first one born here so growing up it was my mom was cooking for the whole family and you know we're not involved she's just trying to like you know get through the day with, yeah. with cooking all the food and everything so it's definitely like so many changes culturally that happen and i think it's so important because you know, one of the other things when I was speaking with the nutritionist is just the amount of stuff we can't pronounce in the back of the chip bag or the whatever it is, the cookies or, you know, there's so many things being put in our food. Do you think that's a contributing factor that of kind course. of makes us um, 
even like it, bioengineered food, things that you wouldn't think, but you keep going back to these foods. So do you feel like they're more unhealthy now than they were, say, 20 years ago? Well, refined food is mm -hmm. one of the problem for uh, for the obesity. And we try to help the family just to, to refrain from, from those options of food. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, this is a contributing factor. It has uh, some... Uh, like that increase this has certain uh, they put some tasteful uh, material that make you have more right and the additives that they put it in order to prolong the shelf age or uh, this also can affect the the quality of food yeah. so if you uh, the simplest thing that we usually I you know give it to the parents just to look at it and for the children this is my plate this was uh, uh, produced by the CDC a few years back. And it's very, very simple, very visual. And it's great. This gives the parents how much of uh, different kind of food should be placed in the plate. Okay. Just a picture showing here is you need to put how much of protein, here is mm -hmm. a carb, uh, vegetables, or fruit. And this is very simple. And every parent actually appreciate to have one. And uh, it's easier for them and easier for children to understand. Definitely. And just from my experience, I mean, it's it's hard. It, it does require a lot of self-discipline. It's not easy to, to say no to certain foods. I mean, after a while, it becomes a habit. But I think that um, people, when they are on this journey to lose weight or to eat healthier, just because I've seen it in my family, they want a quicker fix. Like it's, it's you'll see results after more of a, of a, two or three weeks of doing, you know, consistently something. And this is something that we try to avoid for children. Mm -hmm. We'd like them to focus on health, not right. to, for weight loss. And health, and usually say so that's what you're learning in the clinic is something that you're going to live with it. Right. We don't want you to to lose weight fast because we know that's not going to be healthy and you're going, most likely you're going to gain it back. Mm -hmm. So just the focus on health, this will be actually a, a good choice unless the child has complication of obesity like hypertension high cholesterol or diabetes those the ones that they need maybe a little bit more help than just a healthy diet so what would you recommend a parent for their first step because it's not always about what you're seeing on the scale yeah the first step identify the barrier or identify the cause and the management has to be personalized. Mm -hmm. What's going on at home? What's uh, uh, family history, uh, complication of obesity that they have, mental health, are they having an anxiety, eating disorder? All this need to be assessed and evaluated well and, and identified to be addressed. So not everyone the same, but as a general for everyone, I usually tell them that, okay, you have four things that you have to do. Every time you're going to come, we're going to talk about the four things. How's your mood? How, how you feel about yourself? Uh, sleep. Sleep is really important. If they don't sleep, tendency of increased weight because they eat more. So mm -hmm. sleep quantity and quality is really, really important. Uh, physical activity and inactivity. How much of screen time do you spend? How much of physical activity you spend? You know, how can we do to do better? And then the diet, you tell me an update about what you may, what changes have you done? What changes were not you were not able to make so we can have a plan and address it. And always, always I'll tell them that everyone is different. Just mm -hmm. do your best and next time you come and tell me what works and, do and what doesn't work and then we can have a plan accordingly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's not too late for anyone. And I think that's the biggest takeaway. And, and there's always ways to improve. So thank you so much, Dr. Mona Issa, for, for taking your time to tell us about this valuable information. And I know that, um, you know, for all of our viewers out there, if you have any questions or comments, please do put them in the comment section here. Thank you so much, Dr. Issa. This was very great and very informative. Thank you for interviewing me. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you all for joining us for this edition of Parent to Parent. We will be back next week with another topic. Hope you have an awesome week.